I was going to say, where are all those Easter people? Good morning, church. I got distracted by another hair. I thought it was a haircut, but it's just pulled back. I'm like, wow, she really got it cut short. Yeah. No, but it's pulled back. Now I can see, sort of. Thank you for joining us online, <laughs> those of you who are here and can't see what I'm talking about. Judy has her hair done differently, and so I just commented on that. Um, if you're in the back, come on up to the front. If you're in the front, thank you. We are going to get started. Leah, you coming up? Let's go. I think this is the church at Whistling Pines. This is the first Sunday after Easter. And I guess we wore some people out last week. They decided, <laughs> they decided to rest <laughs> this week. But we are going to worship our Lord as if the house was full. Amen. Because where two or more are gathered together, he is here in the midst of us.
the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Amen.
Amen, God. We know, we recognize, we give you all the glory this morning, and we know that the battles that we are facing, God, the, the walls that have come up in front of us, the mountains in our path, God, we give it all to you. We say the battle belongs to you. You are worthy. You are able. You are willing, God, to fight our battles for us if we will just turn them over to you. So, God, I pray right now that everybody in here, in their mind, whatever's coming to mind right now that's got them frustrated or bitter or angry or sad and grieving or worried or anxious or depressed, God, any of that would be gone in the name of Jesus. We give it to you, God. We say we want you to fight our battles. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. So before we um, go out, I want Brenda to come on up, and we're going to do our new um, volunteer of the month. We have a new one. Whoop, whoop. Brenda's not it. Brenda's just giving it, right, just so you know. So save your applause. That's right. Good morning. Good morning. I'm very honored today and happy to um, recognize our volunteer of the month. It's Linda Anthony, so Linda. Yay, Linda. Whew. Yay. All right. Linda um, texted me or emailed me and said, oh, I just read the update, and I'm the volunteer of the month. I can't believe it. And I was like, believe it. Linda has been attending here a member, a part of us for how many years? A lot of years, maybe 10? Yeah. 10 years, 10 years. And Linda is always so quick to say, yes, I'll do it. So she's um, the friendly face that you see at the front door when you come. A lot of Sundays she's out there and works in the food pantry. And just uh, an all-time great volunteer. Linda will be leaving on Friday to go back north, Aww. north. Aww. So, yeah, how long? When are you coming back? End of October. Oh, good. October. Seven months. Come closer. <laughs> so they can hear you, too. Oh, do you have anything to say? Just a uh, truly... Uh, <laughs> I'm very honored to, to receive this. It means a lot. I love my work as reader. I don't think you can tell that I enjoy that. Um, and I find working in the food pantry very fulfilling. And if you've never done that, you should try it because it's amazing to know that once a month, when you see a lineup of cars and trucks out there, people who absolutely depend on you for some food, some help, you can really feel like you are the hands and feet of Jesus. And if there's anyone who's here all year round and would like to try it, the team could use your, your help. So thank you again. Um, so many of you have become dear friends. I will miss you, but this is not goodbye. This is just see you in a while. So thank you. Thank you, Linda. God bless you. So it's pretty obvious there's a vacancy now. I'm sorry? I say it's pretty obvious, but there's a vacancy now. With Linda being gone for this, somebody's got to step in and, and fill yes. that slot. That was food my, pantry. my next. I'm sorry. <laughs> they ask me to do these things, and then they want to talk for me. So. <laughs> anyway, yes, we do have a vacancy. We need people who would be willing to get here at 9.15, and, and be our greeter at the front door. We also have other vacancies. As you can see, Turtle is doing three jobs this morning. He's four. Superman, Turtle. Technically four. We love our volunteers here, and we do have vacancies, so if there's something that you see that you want to do, let us know. We need you, okay? All right, next. Next turtle. I'm up. I'm. Doesn't he do a great job? He does. Yes. Thank you, turtle. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm up here to talk about the ladies' life group, and the ladies' life group 
uh, came about because there were ladies that came to me and said, you know, we used to meet together for lunch, and we don't do that anymore, and I really miss it. So I'm like, okay, great, let's do it, because I'd gotten a little bit lax in planning those things. So anyway, the Ladies Life Group meets monthly on a Tuesday. It's different Tuesdays of the month, but normally the like the second Tuesday of the month. And we meet in various locations. We go house to house. And when I was thinking about this, I thought of a scripture that I wanted to use. Okay, great. Now I have to find it again because my phone moved. It's in Acts, chapter 2. Lynn, do you have anything to say while I'm looking? Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, it is. I know. I have it here, but I'm in chapter 3. What does it say? Yeah. Yeah. Can you quote it for me? I can't even, I can't even find that. Tell us about it. No, I can't. For everybody that's watching today on <laughs> online, we appreciate you joining us. And um, anyway, the ladies' life group is we have a really good time. We go house to house uh, and we have lunch and we fellowship together and we pray for each other and we encourage each other in the Lord. And yeah, you're good, Turtle. You found it. Oh, and it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship <laughs> and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. <laughs> so that describes the ladies' life group. We're going to be meeting this coming Tuesday at 8, 1130 at Sonia. Sonia's house on beautiful Lake Yale. And if you have trouble finding that location, if you want to meet here at 1115, we'll go there together. Please bring uh, bread, dessert, uh, salad or vegetable because Sonia is preparing the main dish. So I want to invite any, all of the ladies, everybody is welcome to come. And we're going to uh, be talking of a special ladies event in May so y'all come okay oh thank you so before Brenda goes down because we don't get to hear her pray a lot um, I'm going to ask her to pray over the offering and then we're going to take that are you sure you want me to I'm like the comedy act today no, you got it. <laughs> you got it. father we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us we thank you God for everyone who's joined together here to worship you. Father, we ask you to bless our time here this morning. Bless the people as they give, Lord. I pray that you would multiply it back to them and meet every need in their life. And we ask you to guide us as we um, steward your money, Lord, and that we would do exactly as you want us to do. Bless us today, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Brenda. Okay, so kids are dismissed. Those of you in the room, if you are um, members or regular attenders, you know you can put your tithes and offerings in the boxes on the sound uh, booth. If you're at home, there's four different ways to give. You can mail it in through snail mail. You can text 84321 with the amount you'd like to give. Or if you go online to the website or check your weekly email from Brenda, there are links there to give. And um, so this is a time that you can give. And if um, you're a guest, we don't want you to give, but we do want you to get up and walk around and greet one another. That's for everybody.
Okay, if you guys will make your way back to your home base, Sean's going to come up. Good morning, Church at Whistling Pines. I have to pull that out every once in a while. Terry and Judy are going to pass out some papers to you. Where's Judy? Oh, there's Judy. Awesome. Everybody gets one. These are the introductions to 2 Samuel and 1 Kings. We're doing this now so that we don't pile on more information for the message. So you're going to get your papers. Man, everybody's just hugging each other and loving each other. That's a good thing. Fellowship is good. But now it's time to get started. <laughs> okay, so as you know, we're going through our series around the Bible in 366 days. And what we have been doing is when we're about to get into our reading a new book of the Bible, we do a short introduction. It's on a handout that you can put in your Bible or put in a folder or whatever you would like to do. And I also do it from the stage so that we can... Look at it all together. So, 2 Samuel, the author is unknown. Not Samuel, we talked about this with 1 Samuel, since the events of the book take place after his death. Some suggest Abathar the priest. The date is approximately 1010 through 970 BC, and this is the reign of David. The book is mostly about the reign of King David. The genre is Old Testament narrative. Again, I I know I say it after every time we've gone through, I think this is the 13th introduction, and so far they've all been Old Testament narrative, but they aren't given in order to find this secret sauce in it. It's given in order to share with with us what went on. A short summary of the book of Samuel David, a man after God's own heart, that it says in 1 Samuel 13, 14, becomes Israel's greatest king. His devotion and adoration to the Lord is inspiring. He desired to show kindness to others, and his heart was soft and pliable before the Lord. David's story also highlights the vital importance of the choices we make, and that's what we're going to be talking about in the message portion of the service. A quick synopsis of the book of 2 Samuel. When King Saul died, David was made king by the southern tribe of Judah. Seven years later, after the death of Saul's son, Ishobeth, king of the northern tribes, David becomes ruler of all of Israel. So he waited so long to become king after he was anointed to be king by the prophet Samuel. He had to wait even longer to become king of all of Israel. God promises David, your throne will be established forever. Obviously significant because Jesus, the king of Israel, Jesus, the king of everything, is in his lineage. And this promise was important for that reason. David stays home from battle one spring and commits adultery with Bathsheba. That's what we're talking about today. And uh, he, then kill, he then has her husband Uriah, one of his soldiers, killed. The prophet Nathan confronts David of his great sin. If you remember, he talks about a, a, a little lamb, and then he says, you're the man. David repents, and God forgives him, but the consequences of his sin will affect David mightily as it plays out in the story. One of David's son, Amnon, rapes his half-sister. A second son, Absalom, kills Amnon in revenge. Absalom then conspires to steal the kingdom from his father, causing David to flee for his life again. I do not want to make light of scripture, but this book is definitely similar to a soap opera. Much drama goes on. Absalom dies in battle with David's men. David grieves so deeply that it offends his soldiers. He makes amends and returns to Jerusalem to reassert his kingship. David raises another son, born to Bathsheba, Solomon, who will play an intricate part of the story. God's anger burned against Israel, so he incited David to take a census of the fighting men. David was given three choices of punishment, and David chose the choice of three-day plague. Okay, 
Did you get that? You ready to, to dive into 2 Samuel? Well, before you, do, before you do that, we're going to talk about the introduction to 1 Kings, which you will get into later in the week. The author is not stated, and it's unknown. Much of the Old Testament is like that. Uh, one early tradition claimed Jeremiah the prophet wrote both 1 and 2 Kings. We're not sure. The date covers events from 970 to 850 B.C., probably written sometime after the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. It's an Old Testament narrative. Short summary, King David, before he dies, names his successor, his son Solomon. There's some, some drama that goes into that as well. Solomon builds God a permanent temple in Jerusalem. If, if you'll remember in 2 Samuel, or we are about to read actually, sorry, um, God, David has it on his heart to build a temple for the Lord, but he says, you're not going to, your offspring will. And so that is, in fact, Solomon. When Solomon dies, his son, Rehoboam, antagonizes the people of Israel, and ten northern tribes form their own nation under Jeroboam, Jeroboam excuse me, a former official of Solomon's. Two southern tribes continue under Solomon's line in a nation called Judah. So this is where... Israel's in the north, Judah's in the south. Two nations, they're all Israel, though, all Israelites. The the kings of both nations are are, uh, chronicled. In a dream, God offers Solomon to give him anything he wants. Solomon asks for wisdom to govern God's people. God gives him that and also wealth. So there has never been anyone more wise or wealthy than Solomon as far as purely human beings. Solomon follows God and astounds many until he marries 700 women. And then you also count 300 concubines. That does not seem wise. Mostly foreigners who turn his heart away from God and toward idols, which not only brings Solomon to destruction, but starts the downward spiral of Israel itself. The prophet Elijah shows up in chapter 17. No no warning, he's just there, and he's already doing God's work in chapter 17. Elijah confronts King Ahab and Queen Jezebel of Israel regarding their worship of the false god Baal. There's a showdown on Mount, on Mount Carmel between Elijah and the 400 prophets of Baal. Jezebel threatens to kill Elijah, and he runs for his life. God's supernatural sustains him, and then he appoints him to anoint a successor, which is Elisha. Elijah, successor is Elisha, and it gets really confusing. Elisha, who was a farmer, went back to say goodbye to his parents. He then slaughtered his oxen and burned his plowing equipment to cook the meat on. Basically, the old adage of burning your bridges, he did that. He just completely served God. His old past, he burnt to the ground, literally. After the Lord told King Ahab of his impending doom, he humbled himself because he did. So this King Ahab, who was married to Jezebel, did much evil, but because he humbled himself, God said he would not bring this disaster in his day, but will bring it on his house in the days of his son. Those are the introductions, and we are going to continue with worship. Thanks for listening. I'll be back for the message. Thanks, Sean. Um, So before we um, continue singing in worship, we're going to have a prayer time. I overheard um, Pat saying that Karen was sick, right? Anything in particular or? Okay. Okay. So we're praying for Karen Bulick. Um, She's home sick today. Did I hear that Mary had it? Had a testimony? Mary, do you want to do that now? Come on. You want to come up or just up in front? Okay. This is not my story. It is my nephew's story, whom y'all prayed for five months ago. He had bile duct cancer that had mastitis to the liver. He called me this morning. His liver only has three little bitty spots of cancer. Um, 
he has to take no more chemo. He's on some new medicine that he only takes once a month. And he's doing great. His blood works perfect. The cancer's clearing. But that's his story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing his story, Mary. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to share or a prayer that they would like to ask for? Yes, ma'am. You want to come up? Oh, okay. Awesome. So Sean and Sarah uh, Cameron, who were here think, on over a year now, right? Two years? Wow. Um, they, they were, they are a part of this congregation or apparently coming back to Florida at least for a visit or for good? Hmm. For a visit. Okay. So we're officially praying for travel mercies because they're traveling with three young children. Um, but maybe in the back of your mind you could pray that the, the travel isn't so great that they want to do it to go back. Would that be bad? That would be so bad and so manipulative. So we say, God, your will be done in their lives, and we're, we thank you for their lives, and we pray for travel mercies. Anybody else? Jerry and Jane. Jerry, I believe, is getting better, but Jane has been hospitalized. Do we know what's going on with Jane? She's having trouble walking. All right. Anybody else? Jerry. Oh, you were just up here. Wow. Right. So, so Mary went into AFib and, and caused some sort of spark or something in her defibrillator, which was kind of scary. She seemed to be okay now. So we just pray that that will never happen again. That's terrible in Jesus' name. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to do that. Anybody else? We all good? All right, God, we lift these prayers up to you. Um, God, you command us to bring you um, all of our prayers and petitions. God, you say don't be anxious about anything, don't worry about anything, but bring it all to you. And God, we've already sang a song about the battle belonging to you. And so, God, we give all of our battles to you, whether it's with our health, as with um, Karen and Jerry and Jane. Um, God, but we also lift you up, Lord. We praise you um, for uh, the success that's, that's happened in Mary's nephew's life, God. We give you the glory for that, and we're so excited when prayers are answered in the way that we want them to be answered. But God, we know that you answer them all, so I just pray that you would, um, God, open our hearts and our minds to understand what you're doing and God, for when we don't understand, Lord, to accept it and to know that it's all um, part of your will and that we may never understand it um, this side of heaven, but God, to just trust you completely, God, that you are completely holy, that you are completely righteous, that you are completely good and worthy of all of our praise. And so we give that to you this morning, Lord. We pray for health. We pray for prosperity. We pray for um, renewed uh, relationships, God, we pray for healing from um, addictions, and, and God, all of the things that you hear on our hearts, we pray for all of that, but mostly, God, we just lift you up today and say you are worthy, 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 and we love you so much. Amen.
Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. The incense that this song speaks of is the prayers of the saints. And God said in Exodus, I believe, that the incense needed to be pure and holy, that our prayers need to be pure and holy when we rise up, when we raise them up to God, that we are submitting ourselves to him and to his will, that even though we have our wishes and desires, the praises that we give him, the prayers that we send to him are worthy because he is worthy of it all. Amen. So when we sing that day and night, night and day, that is prayer and praise never ending, never ceasing, every waking moment. The first thing that you do when you wake up, the last thing you do before you close your eyes is to acknowledge God, to acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and to give him all the glory and all the honor and all of the praise day and night. praises up to you this morning. God, you are worthy of it all. We thank you for the blessings in our life, God. We thank you for our health. God, we thank you for our ability to come here on Sunday mornings. We thank you for this place, for this leadership, God. But even when we're not in a thankful mood, Lord, even when we are in the valley, even when we are struggling, God, we say you are worthy. situation of our life is like. So God, I pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears to hear the message that you have for us today. God, I pray for Sean that he would be clear and concise and that it would touch our hearts in a way that we grow deeper in our relationship with you. We love you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let's try.
try that again. You may be seated. That was me. Sorry. So from Lynn's prayer from her lips to God's ears that I would be concise. (laughs) I caught that. Man, wasn't worship amazing this morning? (sighs) Lord, you are worthy to be praised. You are so worthy, Lord. Thank you, God. Lord, I ask that as we now open up your word, Lord, that you would bring freedom, freedom to us today, Lord. Lord, every single person here watching, not watching, Lord, that you would bring freedom through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please, if you would, grab your Bibles and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. We are going to talk about a very familiar story to anyone who's been a part of the church at, at all, and that's David and Bathsheba. When you hear the names David and Bathsheba, you obviously already think of some of the story. We're going to talk about the story today. Um, just as I prayed, I, I pray that there would be freedom this morning for all of us and that something would click. Not, not necessarily even something new, although maybe God would, would bring divine revelation to us this morning, but that even things that he's already shown us before, that something would click. It would all align, uh, much like a, a puzzle. All of the pieces would come together, and we would actually walk out our freedom. So let's first read the first four verses of Second Samuel chapter 11. It says, In the spring... At the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the, Am- the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness. Then she went back home. I'm going to show a quick video clip. Oh, now I am. The mind of a man can find works differently than someone on the outside. He sees things in a different way. We got a runner. We need to test a top secret high tech prison holding the world's worst criminals. When do we start? I'm Warden Hobbs. Hobbs. Where's Warden Marsh? There is no Warden Marsh. There's no away who were you before you came in here i break out of prisons for a living you don't look that smart you don't either the people who paid for you to be here want you here this morning i want to talk about an escape plan that god gives all of us in first corinthians ten thirteen. It says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Before I talk about the other part of this incredible scripture, this has ministered to me so much, this whole passage, but the first part, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, means that every temptation that we've encountered, even the temptations that we feel are vile and just hideous, by the way, God sees all of it that way, but the ones that we're the most ashamed of, the ones that we're like slapping ourselves and saying, why in the world would I be tempted with that? Much less fall into that trap and give in to that temptation and sin. There's a part of us that the, the enemy whispers in our ears, you're the only person that would feel or think or be desiring what you're desiring. You're the only one. You're the one that has no hope because of what you're thinking, because of what you're tempted with, because of what you're giving into, you're the only one. And 
I don't even know if you can serve God. All of these thoughts come to us when we think we're alone. It's one of the things, do you remember in 1 Peter, it says that uh, Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. One of the things that a a lion or, or any beast of the fields do is take somebody away from the flock, take someone away from the group, and isolate them to attack them. So that's one of the first things that the enemy does when he tempts us is tries to isolate us. So first, before we go any further, you are not the only one. I've had the same temptations you have. Maybe they're slightly different. Maybe you've given in to a temptation I haven't. Maybe I've given in to a temptation you haven't. But humanity is all the same. So we need to know that. We need to hear that. I'm so thankful that the Apostle Paul wrote that in Holy Scripture. He continues, God is faithful. Man, we need to remember that too. He's faithful when we're not faithful. When we give in to temptation, he's still faithful. He still has his promises. This passage that is a promise is still applicable no matter who we are or what we've done or what we continue to do. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. This is a passage that is pulled out of context so often. When you're going through something, your loved one has cancer or whatever, somebody very loving and and caring will say, God will not give you more than you can handle. It's not true. Everything is more than we can handle. It's just not true. It's taking this passage about temptation and putting another meaning on it. But even temptation alone, we cannot handle it without God. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. That means that there's there's a governor on that when you're in God, he steps in. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning is how he steps in. You will not be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. What an incredible promise. Temptations are going to come. They just are. In fact, sometimes God allows them or, or it's part of his plan. Now, he never tempts, Scripture says, but he allows these temptations in order for us to be more purified and more holy to him. The way that we please him is by being holy, as he is holy. And so, when the temptation is just so great, and maybe we're not so great in our relationship with the Lord, there is a governor in place, and one of those ways, maybe one of the key ways, is this, he gives us a way of escape. I would say ways of escape. We're going to look back at these four verses again and see that actually David had seven different escape routes. Just that I count. Maybe you can count even more of them. He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. How do you endure temptation? You get to a place where you can walk away from it and that you don't give in to it. That's how we endure So, David has two paths ahead of him. Just as every single one of us, whether you've been walking with the Lord for a year, you've been walking with the Lord for 40 or 50 years, these same paths are in our way every single day, every single moment. Guys, can I just tell you, in case you've experienced this before, I've been in prayer meetings before, and this incredible, heinous temptation comes into my mind. Have you ever experienced that before? Maybe you've experienced it already this morning during worship. You're not thinking about it. You're trying to worship the Lord, and it comes anyway. Is the temptation sin? No. It's what we do with the temptation. And so David has on this roof, on a spring evening, a path, a temptation and a way of escape. I'm going to show seven. Let's read them again. Chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. The first way of escape for David is to stay in his routine, his calling. In the spring, when kings went off to war, 
he stayed home in Jerusalem. Now, that's all we know. We don't know why he did. We don't know if he had a bum leg. It doesn't say it, so we just got to assume he didn't. Maybe he needed rest. We need rest. So maybe even the reason that he was doing it wasn't necessarily wrong or evil. But it was out of character. It was out of place. It was out of routine. It was out of his calling. Now, none of us are kings, I don't believe. None of us are leading armies. So we may not completely relate, but relate in the way that you can. What are things that you normally do? One of the things I thought of was, this isn't a commercial for coming to church, but just even having the habit of not assembling ourselves with one another. We've broken a habit. We've broken a routine. We've, we've stepped out of our calling. Do you realize that we're called as Christians to be Christ followers and to be his church? And so when we step out of one or both, we have removed ourselves from our calling. And even if David has taken a sabbatical, taken a break, he's sick, he's, he's worn out, he was do it, whatever the case might be, he opened himself up to see what he saw that caused a temptation. Now, even if God told him, we don't have any, anything in Scripture that says God told him to take a break, but let's just even put that as part of the equation. Even if God told him to take a break, we already mentioned that sometimes God allows temptation to be in our path to see what we do with it, to test us. Sometimes that hurts us. Sometimes we don't understand it. Why would God do that? The reality is he does. And the ultimate reason is so that we would be more like him, so that we would love him more, so that we would be more holy. We would be more set apart. We would be more his hands and his feet and his mind and his mouth on this earth. So the first way of escape that he had is to not even be there with our temptations. Maybe we watch our five senses. What are we opening up to our eyes? What are we opening up to our ears? Where are we going that we shouldn't be going to? Or where are we staying at home when we should be doing something else? All of these things is a way to get out of this temptation. Verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. Nothing wrong with that. He possibly couldn't sleep. All of us have sleepless nights sometimes. Maybe what we do is we go turn on the TV or read a book or something. He happened to just go walking. Seemingly nothing is wrong with that. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Was it a sin that he noticed that the woman was very beautiful? No. Bathsheba was very beautiful. No different than you or I walking in Publix or, or at, at our place of employment and we can notice when somebody is attractive or not. The thing is, is what did he do with it? What do we do with the temptation? So the temptation is square right in front of him. He sees a beautiful woman bathing. His second way of escape is stop looking. I know, easier said than done. But just stop it. Stop looking. You see the woman bathing. You can notice that she's beautiful. And this is where I go back to bed. This is where I go back in the house. This is where I go and do something else. This is where I call Joab on the phone. They didn't have phones then. but And say, yo, where are you guys at? I'm coming to battle with you. Stop looking. The third thing, it's not necessarily in Scripture, but we know that, God, that David is a, a man after God's own heart. This doesn't please the Lord. He had a special relationship with Jesus, with God. He did. He worshipped him in the field as a shepherd. He had this tenderness of heart towards God and towards others that God put in him. He prayed all the time. You read the Psalms. He was constantly singing worship and praying before him and, and opening himself and being vulnerable before the Lord. He knew Scripture. He knew God's heart. And he, he knew that this doesn't please the Lord. If you look back in Genesis chapter 37 when you see Joseph and Potiphar's wife coming at him and saying, you know, 
come to bed with me and, and all of these things. And nobody else is in the palace except for these two. This is the escape route that Joseph took. This thing would be evil in the sight of my Lord, Joseph said. And that very thing I know, doesn't say it, but I just know, was in the heart and the mind of David as well. And he had this very clear escape route. This would not please the Lord. Let's read verse 4. Excuse me, verse 3. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? The fourth way of escape is embarrassment to send someone to inquire about her. Again, granted, I'm reading into what David may have felt, what he may have thought. But he's a human being just like us. The reason he would even send someone else instead of finding out himself was he was sneaking around. He knew what he was doing was not right. He knew what he was doing right now was not pleasing to the Lord. And I don't care who you are, how brash you are, there's a sense of embarrassment when you include someone else in your temptation. And this is what David had, and it's a way of escape. And sometimes God gives us embarrassment so that we can stop with the temptation. Now, wouldn't it all be great if all of us took the way of escape that Joseph did? This wouldn't be right for God. He's displeased with it, therefore I'm going to do it. Man, I would love it if all of us took that escape route. But just being honest, there's so many times I haven't. There's so many times you haven't. This time, David didn't. But here's another path, another way of escape, the fourth one, embarrassment. You're trying to sneak around. You don't want to be too obvious. You don't yourself want to go and inquire, so you send someone else. Can you imagine going, hey, come here. So... There's this beautiful woman on the house next to us. She's bathing, and can you find out about her? But the reality is it seems like he already knew. And he said, isn't this Bathsheba? She is a daughter. And maybe perhaps, especially right now, even more important, she's a wife. And a wife of Uriah. So the next way of escape is she's married. Not just sin... Uh, uh, sex or, 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 or sexual temptation outside of marriage is wrong, but now it's inside of someone else's marriage. She's already married. She already has a husband. Way of escape number five. Way of escape number six goes along with it. She's not just a wife. She's a wife of one of your fighting men, one of your soldiers, one of the men you trust with your life, one of the men that that you go to battle with to represent Israel that ultimately represents God. So if it's not enough that she's already married and not married to you, she's married to one of your friends, one of the people you trust. Already, six ways of escape. Let's look at the next verse, the last verse we're looking at right now, verse 4. Then David sent messengers to get her. After all of that, to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Then she went back home. Escape route number seven. Shame. He had to have felt shame. This person told him, she's already married, and she's married to one of your friends, one of the people you trust. And then either to send that person or someone else to go get her anyway. Shame's involved. Now, God doesn't give shame. Shame is, is completely opposite of God, but God would use shame to give us an escape route. Do you realize that? The embarrassment, the shame, the, the, the guilt, all of these kinds of things are ways of escape. If we've already ran past, this displeases God. If we've already ran past, I'm not supposed to even be here. He allows this remorse to already be starting even before we actually follow through with it. But the reality is, according to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he has already committed adultery in his heart. 
even before number seven, he went and sent for her. Now, we see that he blew past all exits. All seven ways of escape, he just blew past. It was strong. Maybe she was just extra beautiful, right? And he called for her. And so this is, in essence, what he did. Way of escapes, he, he didn't look at, he didn't let them affect him, and he went down the path of temptation. How many of us have done that? A really good exercise, and, and I understand that, that that's the past and it's covered in the blood, but even look at some of those things. Maybe yesterday, maybe 10 years ago, and look at what were the ways of escape that God showed me, and I ignored so he took the way of temptation. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 says, Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire. Now notice it says, it's not each person is tempted when Satan whispers in your ear. Is that a part of it? Sure it is. But they're tempted, I'm tempted, you're tempted, when we're dragged away by our own evil desire, what's inside of us. We were born into sin, in need of a savior, in need of ways of escape, in need of someone pointing to the ways of escape. So we're dragged away with our own evil desires and enticed. Verse 15, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. When we go down the path of temptation, instead of looking away, we keep looking now, if it stopped there, he still sinned. I want us to understand this. I want myself to understand this. It's not just that he went and got Bathsheba, a married woman, and had sex with her. It was he looked at her too long. He had adultery in his heart. So he already sinned. When we do not take an escape route that's given to us by God, we sin because we've given in to the temptation. Very clearly, it's not that he noticed she was a beautiful woman. It's that he kept noticing she was a beautiful woman. It could be any other sin, too. It's not just a heterosexual sexual sin. It could be a homosexual temptation. It could be a temptation to lie or cheat or steal, to, to bear false witness, to, to gossip. All of these things are true, and every time we have a way of escape that's pointed out to us. Let's, let's just even talk about gossip off, off the cuff here. When we want so badly to say something juicy about someone else, we know it's wrong. And there's a check in our spirit. That's an escape route. Are we taking it? Are we going to say, ah, I'll apologize later. I'll ask for forgiveness later. God, this is burning inside me. I can't wait to say it. Then the thought comes... Yeah, but it's destroying a person's character. I mean, so there's so many escapes that we are given by God, including how we feel because God is a God of feeling. Now, if we're only motivated by feeling, no, that's, that's, not, that's not God, but God uses our feelings as well. He has feelings. He has emotions. He's a God that uh, Jesus were, was called a man of many sorrows. So he uses those things. So let's keep reading. And now we're going to talk about what happened with David when he didn't take those seven different ways of escape. Verse 5. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I'm pregnant. Uh-oh. Obviously some time had passed. But she's conceived she found out that she's pregnant and she sends word to David so first and foremost be sure your sin will find you out it says in numbers 32 23 no matter what we think it's secret and private and we're going to get to that in a minute God sees it if no one else sees it we're not hiding anything from him and the truth will come to light anyway, even in our relationships and around the people that we love and know. 
the truth will come out. Your sin will be known. Guys, do you realize even just knowing that is a way of escape? Seriously. Instead of being ashamed, oh my gosh, I can't believe the only reason I'm not giving in to this temptation is somebody might find out about it. So, you're not sinning. That's, that's a win, right? I'm with you. I wish it was always God would not be pleased with me and that's why I'm not giving in to the temptation. But he gives us these ways of escape. So that's the first thing. Verse 6. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah, remember that's Bathsheba's husband, send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. Champagne, no doubt. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all the master's servants and did not go to his house. When David was told Uriah did not go home, he asked him, Haven't you just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, The ark, the ark of the covenant, the presence of God that goes with them, and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open field. How can I go to my house, eat and drink, and lie with my wife? Do you see what's going on? She's pregnant, so he calls him from the battlefield, her husband, Uriah, and, and basically is saying, go sleep with your wife. Here's some champagne and, and some strawberries and some chocolate. Go have a ball. Why? Does he really care about Uriah? Is he like, man, Uriah's a great guy and I feel guilty? He does feel guilty, but he's hiding that she's pregnant and that it's from him. He's wanting to cover up, right? Verse 12, then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, at David's invitation, he ate, <clears throat> excuse me, he ate and drank with him. And David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among the master's servants and did not go home. Even got him drunk. Basically like, now all of his inhibitions are gone. All of maybe his caring about the right thing to do, like I did, is gone. Now maybe he'll go and sleep with his wife. Verse 14. Or verse 13, at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among the master's servants and did not go home. When we do not take the way of escape that God has shown us, we try to hide up and cover up our sin. Just as David did, just as the very first sin and sinners did, Adam and Eve. They covered up in fig leaves. They hid when God was in in their presence. They hid behind bushes. That's what we do with our sin too. When he gives us a way of escape and we give in to temptation and we start to sin, then we feel guilty. We feel shame and we try to cover it up. We don't want anyone to know. The reality of it is we don't want each other to know more than we don't want God to know. Right? And so we'll do anything just as David did. We'll connive and we'll manipulate and we'll do whatever it takes so that no one finds out our dirty secret. Again, just knowing that is yet another way of escape when temptation comes. The truth will come out. Your sin will be known. And people are going to know about it even if you cover up. And they're going to know that you covered up. All of these reasons are reasons we shouldn't give in to temptation, ways of escape. Verse 14, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. Did David actually physically kill him? No. Is he trying to get him killed? Yes. Is it murder? Yes. 
Verse 16, so while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband, died. When we do not take the way of escape, our sin grows and it gives birth to death. Now, somebody may not be murdered, somebody may not die because of our sin, but we have died because of our sin. Death is in our members, death is in our soul, spiritual death. And often it brings death to others as well. In Uriah's case, it was physical death, but we also bring death to marriages. We bring death to relationships, to friendships, to, to our relationships with our sons and our daughters and our friends and our neighbors and people in church that look up to us, that care about us, that are motivated by our testimony. Death comes and sin grows. The wages of sin is death, Paul says in the book of Romans. It happens every time. Just as black clouds bring rain, when we give in to temptation, it's sin, and sin is hungry. It grows, and it gives birth to death within us. Skip to verse uh, 26. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. We, we often don't really think about Bathsheba in this case, do we? We're so concerned with David's story, but Bathsheba lost her husband. Now, this is a different time, a different culture, one that we can kind of maybe try to understand, but we, we don't live in it, so we don't. But women were more of a, uh, a possession, certainly. And so when, when David called for her, she probably didn't have any choice but to sleep with him. Or maybe she would have been killed as well. If he was willing to kill her husband, he certainly was willing probably to kill Bathsheba. So all of these things play into it, but, but also she mourned the loss of her husband. Notice then what it says, verse 27, after the time of mourning, whatever that was, 30 days or whatever, was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. When we give in to temptation, when we don't take the ways of escape, it displeases the Lord. The very thing that should stop us is the reality. Now, this Hebrew word for displeases is the word ra'ah. And it means to spoil, to lit literally by breaking into pieces. This picture that I see is David's life broken into pieces. It's spoiled. I see David's relationship with the Lord broken into pieces and spoiled. Do you? What about your own life? What about my own life when I give in to temptation and I start to sin? Death starts to happen and spoilage and uh, literally breaking into pieces my relationship with the Lord, my relationship with other people is already happening. It is a huge price to pay for a moment of satisfaction to make or be good for nothing to hurt to do wickedly this is what it does to the Lord now we already know from scripture that he picked a prophet named Hosea to marry a prostitute who was going to continue to cheat on him to show him this is how I God I'm not God but in this, in this situation, I'm, I'm talking about as if I'm God, that you understand how I feel when you're unfaithful to me. So that's what it means to display, displease the Lord, is it crushes him. Not as humans are crushed. He doesn't need our affection like we need his affection and our own affection. Nonetheless, whatever it is, it displeases the Lord. This is huge. I'm afraid that most of us are governed with the idea of it's easier to just go ahead and do it and ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. What does that say about our relationship with the Lord? Seriously. And I mean that in all sincerity because I have to deal with that too. 
it tells me that Ra is going on in my soul. That something is wrong. Something is broken into pieces in my psyche, in my soul, in my understanding of what God wants from me. He says in the next chapter, when he sends the prophet Nathan to talk to David, he says, uh, Nathan says to, to David, you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes. And then consequences happen. Consequences always happen. Even after repentance, we need to understand this. Does God forgive? Absolutely, yes. Jesus died a horrible death to take our sins upon him so that we would be forgiven. But that doesn't mean the consequences go away. David repented right there in the next chapter, chapter 12, when Nathan confronted him. He's like, oh my gosh, I've sinned against the Lord. Everything you're saying is correct. In Psalm 51... One of the most beautiful psalms we have is all about David repenting because of his sin with Bathsheba. It says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David repented, but there were still consequences. The consequences David had to bore is, are different than, than we do, but there are consequences. You can be forgiven and set free and be a new creation in Christ Jesus, but you still may need to serve a jail term. For what you did in our society. You're forgiven and and you've got got a clearance into God's holy throne. And you can ask him for anything and he loves you and you're his child. But your marriage may be kaput. There's consequences for everything that we do. Even the little things that we think are no big deal. Our whole society is doing it. Why can't I do it too? There's consequences. With David, he lost their child that she was pregnant with. He said to him that somebody very close to you is going to sleep with your wives in broad daylight. That happens with his own son, Absalom. There's consequences to our actions, to giving in to this momentary pleasure. It's so fleeting. It's the same way as, oh my God, I want to eat this cake so bad. And you eat it and you feel disgusting afterwards. And it's gone. It's digesting in your body. And it was for a moment. He also says in chapter 12, verse 12, you did it in secret, but I will do it in broad daylight before all Israel. God doesn't play. David was so concerned to keep his secret that he even committed murder. And God, in, I'm paraphrasing and saying, I saw everything, and now everyone's going to see everything. Should that be the reason we don't sin? Take it. It's a way of escape. I want to go back to end with the escape route number one that I shared about David. Remember? Springtime when kings go off to war, David sent Joab with his men and he stayed in Jerusalem. Remember, I said that it was staying in routine or calling. We're not all kings, we're not all commanders of armies, but what is our routine? What is our calling? This is true for every Christian, this passage. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor or a layperson. It doesn't matter if you have the ability to, to have one, one gift or another. This is all of our callings. Galatians 5, 16 through 18. But I say, walk by the Spirit. Every single one of us are called to walk by the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit of God lives within us. The same Spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives within us if we are a child of Christ. If we are a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, then the Spirit of the living God is inside of us. And every one of us have the same calling to walk by the Spirit. Notice it says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now notice, this is a positive. It's not written as a negative. In other words, it's not stop doing what you're doing, stop sinning, don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. 
it's written in a positive. Walk by the Spirit, and if you walk by the Spirit, it would breed this, that you do not give in to the desires of your flesh. This is powerful. Guys, this is, this is uh, the gospel. No different. It's just as powerful as John 3.16. Unfortunately, we have taken an element out of the gospel. Every single one of us understands the gospel as, as being reconciliation to God and him taking the penalty of sin away from us that is spiritual death. But there's another element that we forget so often about, and it's this. It's sanctification. It's he takes away the power of sin. Not by telling us, whoa, whoa, you shouldn't do it. I, wouldn't be, I would be displeased with it. But by putting the Spirit of God within us, and as we walk with Him, those things fall off. I want to ask you a question. If you're walking by the Spirit, do temptations still come? Absolutely. Don't let anybody tell you differently. If so, it's a false gospel. But when the temptations come, you're walking another path. You're walking the path of the Spirit of God. It's much easier to see the ways of escape. And more importantly, there's a part of you that still wants to give in to the temptation. That's our flesh. But there's a huge part of us, if we're walking by the Spirit, that doesn't want to. It takes away the appetite. Guys, oh my gosh, it takes away the appetite. Yeah. Are you guys awake? I mean, guys, this is is incredible stuff. If you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, in order that you keep from doing whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That can be confusing to anybody. Who cares, right? I mean, oh, so does this mean now I'm under grace and not under the law? What this means is if I'm walking by the Spirit, it doesn't matter that God's Word even says, do not touch, do not taste. That I'm not governed by that because His law is inside of me. I'm governed by walking with the Spirit. In other words, I have a different motivation. My motivation is to keep on this path walking with the Spirit of God who empowers me to say no, to do not touch, do not taste, do not feel commands. Do we understand that? The law, the reason why none of us can do it is if we're told, you shouldn't do that. That's a sin. Don't do it. We're going to keep doing it. But if he gives us the power, which he has in the spirit of God that lives within us, to not do it, instead to do something more productive, to do something more godly, to do something that does please him, then it's not just the negative of don't, it's what can I do? And when I'm doing it, I don't have the time or the appetite as much to give in to these temptations. It's so simple. It's it's things that we all know. It's things that I'm going to be tempted this afternoon with something. What is my decision? Am I going to give in to it or am I going to say this momentary satisfaction is fleeting and the destruction that's going to happen in my soul, in my marriage, in my relationships with others, the way people view me, it's not worth it. The damage that it does in my relationship with the Lord vertically, it's not worth it. That's walking with the Spirit. It's listening and obeying. Would you stand with me? Now the rubber has to meet the road. Now we have to decide, am I going to take the ways of escape that are given to me? Am I going to actually listen to the Spirit of the living God that is inside of me? I'm going to keep giving in to selfish, fleeting desires that make me feel good or important or whatever lie the enemy gives us for a moment. What are we going to do? Be led by the Spirit. It's not enough to know. We also have to do. Heavenly Father, 
Having said all of that, none of us are capable of doing this on our own. Every single one of us without fail will fall to the next temptation if we are not led by the spirit that is within us. Lord, anoint us. Pour your presence over us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, not just so that we would be to have power to be your witnesses, but Lord, that we would have power to, give, to not give in to temptation. Lord, minister to your people. Minister to me, Lord. God, help us to be done with this world. Fully knowing we're, we're still in sin and we're still going to stumble and fall. But, but Lord, we don't have to just keep going down this path of temptation. Lord, and it's not anything about me or how strong I can be. It's realizing how strong you are. Lord, give us another understanding, a deeper understanding of who you actually are. Who actually makes their abode inside of us. Thank you, Lord, that you take away the power of sin. God, we leave our junk at the foot of the cross. Lord, as we're leaving it, we're, we're grabbing hold of your feet. For dear life, because you are life, we can't do it alone. Empower us in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask that you would restore relationships. You would restore marriages. You would restore our vertical relationship with you, God. Lord, that we would understand who you are, that we would know you in a real and powerful and mighty way. Lord, that it would be a positive that we get to walk with you. And as we're walking with you, the junk just falls off. Lord, help us to trust you. Thank you for freedom this morning. Thank you for the freedom that you are bringing through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to release you, but if you need special prayer for anything, and and by the way, guys, don't think, oh man, if I go up there, people are going to think, boy, have I really gone into sin. That's all of us, okay? So if you need prayer for anything, I'd love to pray with you. I'd like to ask other people who would like to pray for people to to just stay, and, and we want you to love each other and greet each other and all that kind of stuff, but if you could do it behind the petition so that those who are praying up here have a little bit of peace and quiet. Thanks, guys. Love you. Go with the Lord. Walk in the Spirit of God.